breach. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed. President Roosevelt speaks and the Armed Forces Act. Naval secretaries Knox and Forrestal put into effect war plans previously prepared in the event of national disaster. One of the Navy's primary duties is the enormously complex task of funneling the means of survival to our forces and allies overseas. Shipping must be found and assembled, convoys organized and cargoes assigned. But first, orders, directives, requisitions, and more orders. Orders to shipyards, orders to bases, orders to railroads, and orders to America that her factories and workers might begin producing in quantities the boldest economist never dreamed of, that the Axis leaders never dreamed of either. But filling the orders is only the beginning. The products must be sent soonest, where they will count most. machine age is democracy's greatest material asset. Without it, she is defenseless. Without it, defeat is certain. From a port in the Gulf of Mexico, a tanker sets out on her long voyage to England. But first she heads for New York, traveling along well-defined coastal convoy routes made necessary by daring German submarines now operating off the very shores of the United States. From time to time, more ships are fed into the convoys that passes key ports. Life on the tanker has none of the glamour of the grander ships. But unless the merchant sailors get their cargo across the ocean, the battleships will be useless. The carrier might as well be scuttled. She's a dowdy old girl, the tanker. But she's the queen of the convoys. Coastal convoys are organized into an interlocking system that operates like a railroad network. Ships are shuttled back and forth under maximum protection of local escort vessels and air cover from strategically located land bases. Navy PBYs roam the air in predetermined patterns in the convoy areas, ready to warn the ships or attack the U-boats. But the wary subs are seldom sighted. Far more often, what the PBYs spot is the work of the unseen enemy. the enemy leaves a trace, or what looks like a trace, an oil slick. The warning goes out at once and a smoke bomb marks the spot. An escort picks up the PBY's alert. General Porter's sound. Search for the enemy is on. The sonar man seeks the underwater echo that will betray the sub's position. No response. Pause. 
Bob's alarm. All along the coast, cities keep their peacetime lights glowing until they learn how this benefits the enemy. The lights are beacons for the lurking U-boats. Offshore, enemy eyes are patiently peeled, waiting for a silhouette, a target. They dare to fight openly on the surface, a few miles off Main Street, USA. Survivors have gone. The killers have fled. A few random traces in the indifferent sea show a convoy has passed. A submarine has struck. The first leg of the voyage is almost over. New York, into whose harbor pours the wealth of North and South America, offers a temporary haven. Here the Gulf port tankers rest, waiting to be reassembled with other ships into a transatlantic convoy designated HX-0. Ships fill their empty holds with waiting cargo, stuffing them to the bursting point. Getting these supplies to their destination safely will be a dominating factor throughout the war. This is what the Battle of the Atlantic is all about. The operation of a convoy requires organization, seamanship, and a knowledge of the enemy. Merchant captains and escort commanders get last-minute instructions from the convoy commodore and intelligence officers. Some of these men will not live through the ordeal ahead. For all of them, it's only a step or two from the conference table into battle. A battle that will begin as soon as their ships put to sea. to give the convoys protection. From their Lakehurst, New Jersey base, the Navy's lighter-than-air ships cover the convoys it puts to sea. The stately blimps lolling overhead are a comfort 
and a reassurance to the sailors below as they head into the unknown. convoys 50 or 60 ships scattered across 30 miles of ocean must be kept under constant coordinated control. The course zigzags to baffle submarines and precise navigation keeps all ships moving in unison according to a prearranged timetable and pattern. Meanwhile the escorts act as watchdogs with the aid of all the intricate new devices that science has added to war at sea but there are not yet enough of them, leaving dangerous holes in the ring of protection around the convoy. maintaining his ship's proper speed and position. The strain of maintaining station never ceases. The ship that straggles behind is doomed. But for the sailors off duty, shipboard life takes a deceptively normal course until it is their turn to go on watch again. Convoy HX0 is still a long way from England. As it heads into the perilous open spaces of the North Atlantic, the Royal Canadian Air Force furnishes coverage from bases in Newfoundland. Submarines can neither surface nor attack as long as aircraft are overhead. But there are still vast stretches of the ocean over which no air umbrella can be spread. In this fatal gap, the convoys are almost helpless. The U-boat, almost invincible. Fog, the ancient curse of mariners, intensifies all hazards of a hostile sea. The convoy must slow down, a dangerous, desperate measure. Reduced speed favors the enemy, but collision would be disastrous. convoy, nerves raw and weary to the point of exhaustion, strain their eyes, their brains, their faith.
but to no avail. signals the convoy to proceed while she tries to locate the enemy and counterattack. But the battle-wise German seamen know what to do. Submerge. Head for the bottom. Cut the engines. Sweat out the depth charges. work. The escort loses contact and gives up. The German is safe. Safe to kill again. The submarine's eyes and ears have no difficulty in locating a hapless straggler that lost its convoy station in the fog. Surface. Why waste the torpedo? The ship's armed guard has pathetically little with which to resist. But they fight back with all they have. Ship to sub, gun to gun. shuffles along its agonizing course. Tired lookouts and signalmen help pull the convoy together. And as the ships head into more northerly latitudes, the weather will become worse, rendering detection gear less effective as the sea takes over. Six sailors can hold up their heads. Those sore from the buffeting can relax. Everyone can dry out. All hands eat hot food again. Clear skies bring relief, and the men tend to forget the enemy. But their captains know this is folly. There is no safety in these waters. True, the convoy is closer to England, but it's also closer to German air bases. Now the enemy is over the ocean as well as under it. Scouting planes are constantly searching for allied convoys, eager to spot one and radio its position, course and speed back to base. Instantaneously, efficiently, 
the message is decoded at U-boat headquarters on the French coast, where the convoy's position is plotted. Admiral Dönitz, master of the Nazi submarines, devises plans for a major attack by U-boats in the area. He reckons their positions in relation to the convoy and organizes them into a wolf pack. In a matter of minutes, the submarines have top secret orders to rendezvous and proceed to a designated spot in the path of the convoy. Perception is perfect. Prepare for submerge! for his own share of the spoils. No ship is safe. Surviving ships have not much further to go. The long voyage is almost over. England, grim England, to these sailors means victory. Battle of the Atlantic. The men, some of them. The ships, some of them. The supplies, some of them get through. Get through to bring final victory a little nearer. the cost. 